name is Stacey Rye, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Central Committee. And um, Dave Kendall is absent tonight. He had to be in Washington, D.C. We have a two-part meeting tonight, like we do most months. The first part is a wonderful speaker from Helena that has joined us. And the second part, we, um, the Central Committee, Precinct Men and Women, um, please stay for our business meeting because we have to come up with three names to forward to the county commissioners for um, consideration for the vacant House District 98 seat. Thank you all for being here. I think we'll do our customary introductions at the start of the business meeting rather than at the start of this meeting because we're getting started a little bit late. Um, so I would like to introduce um, Monica Lindsay, the Commissioner of Securities um, and Insurance, the Montana State Auditor, right here, we used to call you. Um, and um, I'm just so glad that she's here. She couldn't be here in October and November, which worked out just as well because the website is now up and running. And, um, I think She's just done an amazing job at implementing one of the biggest pieces of legislation since the 1960s, I believe. So um, anyway, she was elected in November 2008. She's a two-term commissioner of securities and insurance. Her mission um, and her office's mission is to protect securities and insurance consumers through education, fairness, and transparency in just, um, I shouldn't say three, I should say five. Five years, her office has returned more than $200 million to investors and insurance consumers throughout the state. She was elected Secretary Treasurer of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners in November 2011. Um, uh, she serves as Vice Chair of the NAIC Health Insurance and Managed Care Committee. She chairs the Designated Program Advisory Committee and is a member of the Executive Committee and Finance Committee. Recently, Monica was appointed to the Federal Insurance Office Advisory Board, which aids the office as just the director in monitoring the insurance industry. She began her career in public service in 1999, representing the rural district in Montana House of Representatives. Um, during her hard work in the legislature, she earned a reputation as a common sense moderate with get things done. Um, she quickly became a leader in the House and served four terms from 1999 to 2006. I believe you're from Great Falls originally. Billings area. Billings. <laughs> Billings area. Area. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My project. I'm from the Pathway project. Athlete project. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's all right. Please help me welcome Monica Lindy and afterwards. Well, question and absolutely, we'll do some Q&A, but thank you so much for uh, the very nice introduction. We need to update a couple of things on it. Um, it's, it's amazing how quickly things change. I'm actually um, now vice president of the NAIC, and next week we'll be elected uh, president-elect, and we'll be president uh, the following year, so kind of excited about that. <laughs> um, Anyway, it's always great to be in Missoula. I was just here like a couple of days ago, freezing my rear end off <laughs> at, the, at the Grizz game. Oh, it was an awesome game, almost. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's, I, like I say, pleasure to be here and uh, want to just visit with all of you for, I don't know, probably 25 minutes or so, go through this presentation. Um, we just got done changing the presentation that we've been doing across the state for the last couple of months. Um, we're trying to kind of update it a little since things have changed. And then I know that I'll do some Q&A and then we've got some folks here that can assist any of you that might be willing to or interested in actually looking at signing up a little later. So with that, um, I'm going to go oh, and I also want to introduce Emily Samhammer who's here with me. She is uh, working in my office doing uh, healthcare policy. And we really uh, appreciate having Emily here. As I said, we're going to talk about Obamacare 101. And I know some folks say, well, why would you call it Obamacare? Isn't that offensive? And I said, well, turns out that uh, that's what most people refer to it to. That's what they know it as. And when you talk about the Affordable Care Act, some people think you're talking about something completely different. And so it just makes sense to talk about what they understand and use the same terminology and frankly as we all know the president has even embraced the terminology as well and I think in one speech said that if this all turns out well someday um, there will be some folks in particular maybe some Republicans who may want to change the name um, so we'll <laughs> see what happens uh, things got off to a little rocky start um, here a couple months or a month or so ago but uh, it's it's definitely turning around again um, but 
we want to talk about the marketplace, actually what that is, what it looks like, what it means to some of you, answer some questions about that, and then talk just briefly about fraud, um, the Medicaid, uh, Medicare gap, and uh, then we'll move on to some Q&A. So as you know, as was mentioned, I'm the Commissioner of Securities and Insurance, Montana State Auditor. We regulate both of these very, very large industries here in the state of Montana. And it's really our job to make sure that consumers are being protected and that we have a very, um, we're promoting a level playing field for those two industries and making sure that they're playing by the rules, which can be a challenge at times. Um, for those of you who um, know anything about state government here in Montana, I know there's a couple people here in the room that do, who have been legislators. Um, we have one of the smallest agencies in state government. We only have 85 employees in this office, and we do an amazing job, in my opinion, um, regulating these two incredibly large industries, which bring in literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into Montana's economy. And then we also do education and training outreach programs, and this is one of those programs. So, as we know, in um, early in 2010, um, the ACA was passed into law, and in Montana we estimated there were about 195,000 uninsured Montanans that could benefit um, from passage of this law because the real underlying purpose of the Affordable Care Act was to make sure that the uninsured got insurance. Um, and so the law was passed and as we all know it was upheld by the Supreme Court in uh, June of 2012. Um, some of the insurance reforms went into effect right away and I'll talk about what some of those reforms were. Um, but I also want to talk about the fact that the insurance commissioners across this country um, there's one in every single state, um, played a really huge role in the debate that went on in Congress when they were actually um, trying to decide how they were going to pass some type of health insurance, health reform um, legislation. Um, insurance commissioners in every state, uh, we have what's called a state-based system of insurance regulation here in this country. Um, the federal government has not been the regulator. It's been the states that regulate. And we obviously feel that we've done a pretty darn good job for over 150 years at regulating insurance companies. And we wanted to make sure that we didn't lose our state-based system of regulation. And so the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, of which I'm a member, obviously, we spent a considerable amount of time um, educating Congress about how we regulate health insurance companies and other insurance companies, um, other types of insurance in, at the state level. And we were pretty darn successful, <laughs> and so successful in fact that the NEIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, is specifically named in the law something like 27 or 28 times. And so we have specific legal obligations um, in terms of implementing the new law. Most of those um, obligations actually entail coming up with certain recommendations, which then we send up to um, the secretary at HHS, Kathleen Sebelius, where she can take our recommendations wholeheartedly, or she can make changes to them, or she can throw them out and start over if she'd like. Thankfully, Kathleen is a former insurance commissioner from the state of Kansas, <laughs> and so she understands um, just how effective we are and the fact that we understand our jobs and so she has to date taken every one of our um, recommendations that we've sent up to her and taken, that, taken them without any changes whatsoever. So we think that's a positive for consumers and all, obviously a positive for state-based regulation. Um, <clears throat> Let me move on to the next slide. So what, what does uh, the new health reform law do. It establishes reforms to help eliminate insurance company abuses, um, which were going on for years. It requires citizens to actually have health insurance coverage. This is probably one of the more controversial aspects of the new law um, because as we all know, nobody likes to be told what to do and nobody likes to be told that they have to purchase something. Um, but at the same time, there's reasons for that mandate. And we can talk more about that later if you'd like. And it, it does also help people 
pay for this health insurance, especially those who can least afford it. And it creates created incentives for states to expand Medicaid. And uh, there was a gap that was actually created in terms of the, uh, the folks that would be eligible for any tax credits or any other types of assistance. And for those that are beneath that um, gap, they would be covered under an expansion of Medicaid. Obviously not thinking that most states, that many states, because of how political this has become, would not go ahead and pass uh, Medicaid expansion. And we'll talk more about that as well. So some of the key health insurance reforms um, that were put into place right away included everything from um, no, pre no cost preventive and wellness care, um, no pre-existing conditions for um, children under the age of 19, uh, no longer were there any, uh, there was no lifetime limits on insurance benefits and no annual limits for essential health benefits as well. And also insurance companies could no longer um, cancel your insurance policy except for some very um, specific um, legal reasons. And then also you could extend coverage for children up to the adult, uh, dependent children up to the age of 26. In Montana, that meant only one additional year because we already had up to age 25 in our state um, law. But in other states, it was a much bigger increase than here in Montana. Um, some of the 2014 health insurance reforms that are going into effect this coming year, um, the biggest one being that there will be no pre-existing exclusions allowed for anyone, no matter what your age is, meaning there will be guaranteed issue, meaning that if you have had any type of health issues, whether it's cancer, diabetes, what have you, no longer can insurance companies not sell you an insurance policy because of that. Um, no longer can they rate your insurance policy based on your past health conditions. And that's a huge deal for anyone that's had health issues. Um, they can um, make some difference, do some differences in rating based on your age, um, geography, and whether or not you use tobacco. <laughs> so um, as somebody who used to smoke, I can tell you that if you're still utilizing tobacco, it might be a good time to quit. Um, it's not easy, I know, but it can be done. <laughs> um, single risk pools are also now, will also now be included in the individual and small group markets, meaning instead of having multiple risk pools in the individual market or the small group market, you will have one risk pool in each one, it's in each market, which means that you're gonna have a bigger group of people to spread the risk across, and this is a good thing. Um, absolutely a good thing. So, the, of course, the major um, challenge there is making sure that we get as many people as possible into those two pools in order to spread that risk. Um, large employers um, must provide insurance under the new law. Um, that does not mean that, and obviously small businesses we know are exempt from that particular mandate, so if you have less than 50 employees, um, you do not have to offer coverage for your employees. Um, in Montana, that means almost every business. Um, we are a small business state. Um, insurance companies must also spend in the individual market 80% of every dollar of premium that you pay um, on um, direct medical claims or any, and wellness activities that will benefit you as the policy holder. Um, this is one of the things that we at the NEIC worked on. It's called an MLR or medical loss ratio. Um, it's 80% in the individual market and 85% in the small group market. So what happens if the insurance company doesn't spend up to 80%? You get a rebate for the difference. So that's a, that's a positive for you as well as a consumer. So you're paying this premium, you should get some benefit from it. We're saying that you get a benefit of 80% of every dollar, the rest they can spend on admin expenses. If, they don't, if you don't get that benefit, you get the difference. It's a positive, it's a positive reform for the consumer. In every single one of the policies that's offered on the new exchange, website, in the new marketplace, whatever you want to call it. Um, every one of those insurance policies has to also include what are called the 10 essential health benefits. And that includes a host of items, includes everything from making sure that doctor's office visits are cover covered, um, mental health 
um, visits are covered, um, maternity and newborn services, hospitalization, prescription drugs, the list goes on. Um, what's really good about this for Montana is that many of these benefits were actually already included in Montana law as mandated. Um, in some states they did not have as many of these mandated um, benefits and as a result some states are actually experiencing some sticker shock. Um, but we're not here in Montana so thankfully that's a good thing for us. Obviously you know as those of us who've been in the legislature know that that's something that um, some folks really complained about was the fact that we had these mandated benefits but it turns out that not only was it always a good thing for consumers but it also turned out to be a good thing because of the health reform law and not then seeing this huge sticker shock all at once. So um, do you have to purchase insurance? Well <laughs> according to the law yes. Um, you need to purchase insurance as an individual and you, but there are some, um, um, there are some folks who are actually exempt from purchasing, which I can talk about in a second. But one of the things that's really important to note is that um, there is some confusion for folks. They think that they're if, that if they're on Medicaid or Medicare, that somehow or another, that their coverage is going to change, and that just isn't the case. Um, if you're on Medicaid, Medicare, if you're on VA, utilizing VA, VA TRICARE, healthcare or TRICARE or if you have a child that's on the CHIP program, you don't have to do anything different. You are considered covered and so there's no need um, to go out and you know think that you need to all of a sudden um, go out and purchase in the new marketplace or that you're somehow going to lose your benefits because that just is not the case. So, excuse me one second. My, mouth, my throat's getting a little dry. Um, you also don't need to uh, purchase your insurance on the new marketplace, obviously, as I said, if you already have um, insurance through these other, other means. And those of you that have got insurance through your small employer, you can continue to keep that. That's not a problem. Now I know that, and I will go ahead and talk about this because I know it's been in the media, <clears throat> there has been you know, some discussion about the fact that the president made the statement that anyone who liked their insurance could keep it. And then here a few weeks ago, um, some folks who have um, policies in the individual market started getting letters from their insurance company saying that they were not going to renew those policies. And instead, they were going to have to get a, a um, ACA compliant product and in many cases and I think in most cases it was a much more expensive policy and a lot of people were really upset and I can understand why because some of the increases for that new policy were extra I mean they were huge <clears throat> but the reality is this the insurance companies didn't have to change what was being offered. This was a business decision that they made. They are the ones that, decide, that decided to actually not offer this particular product anymore. So it really was a business decision by the insurance company and the fact that they sent out these letters and said here's your option is not the full story. Um, while that's an option in the existing old individual market, <clears throat> it wasn't the only option. It is not the only option for these people. Um, you can also go to the new marketplace and actually look at purchasing uh, a product from one of the three companies, including Blue Cross Blue Shield of Montana, um, and purchase a product there where then you can also take advantage of the tax credits that are available. And in many cases we're finding that people are actually getting coverage for cheaper than what they had originally and it's much better coverage. So the new marketplace obviously is an online marketplace where people can go and purchase private insurance. It's not a government health insurance program. The three, the three companies that are providing coverage or providing policies in the new marketplace are Blue Cross, uh, Pacific Source and the new healthcare co-op. It's the only place where you can purchase a policy and take advantage of the tax credits that are being offered um, by, the by the 
Affordable Care Act. Um, if, you try, if you go ahead and purchase outside the new marketplace, in the old marketplace, you will not be able to use, utilize um, those tax credits. And it also allows you to actually look at um, comparing the different policies that are available on what we call an apples to apples basis. And we're, we believe it will also help encourage uh, some competition. Um, in Montana, as, as was mentioned earlier, and has been mentioned more than once. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Montana's marketplace was built by the federal government. Um, we did try to get a state-based marketplace. Um, we went to the 2011 legislative session um, with a piece of legislation that was supported by, you know, stakeholders from all across the state um, that included everyone from consumer advocates to business, um, insurance industry agents, you name it. Um, unfortunately, the politics were incredibly um, difficult. I'm trying to be nice here. <laughs> and uh, they, they rejected our, uh, our suggestion that we should uh, build a state-based marketplace and actually control what happens in that marketplace, which really turns out to be, as I've said, uh, um, very unfortunate because I think that we would have done a much better job with the rollout. And I think that if you look at what other states have done with their rollout, where they actually did state-based uh, marketplaces, uh, for the most part, except for one that I can think of, it really has gone more smoothly. Um, Kentucky is probably the best example. Um, they've, had, they've done a great job. Um, People were allowed to start buying policies on October 1st. Um, <laughs> uh, it was an interesting day, let's, to say the least, as we all know, um, because there were some serious technical issues with the website um, at the federal level. And so any state that had a uh, federally built marketplace um, really saw that most people who attempted to try to get on and purchase a policy had no success whatsoever. Um, many of you know though that uh, they have made a ton of changes uh, to the new website. They've been working night and day to fix um, a lot of the IT problems that exist and um, it's my understanding from talking to um, a lot of the assisters out there and producers and also from what we're hearing from folks at the federal level that it really is working much more smoothly. Most people are able to get through. Um, I imagine that there are some other technical difficulties that are going to continue to be worked out but it's starting to move in the right direction and it's a positive thing because I mean truly there were so many folks out there that re really, really were just desperate um, to sign up for this coverage that uh, it's really great to hear that they're finally able to get that accomplished. Um, for folks who want to have their coverage take effect by January 1st of 2014, they will need to have purchased um, those policies by December 23rd. Originally it was December 15th, but they've extended it uh, because of the technical difficulties that they experienced initially with the rollout. Um, but for those who aren't concerned about having that uh, new policy be effective on January 1, please know that you still have until the end of March to actually enroll and purchase a policy. Um, we they have an extended enrollment period this, this, this first time around. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of, there'll be a lot more discussion about that in the media um, as time goes on throughout this enrollment period. Um, we will continue as the regulator in the state of Montana to actually regulate all the plans that are in the new marketplace just as we have always regulated um, all plans in, the, um, in, in Montana's uh, marketplace. So we're going to continue to do that. We worked really hard. Um, even though we were not able to do a state-based exchange um, to make sure that we developed a relationship with the federal um, government um, to make sure that we weren't duplicating efforts um, because in, in some states where they didn't develop a kind of a partnership um, in those states you see insurance companies having to get the forms for each policy and the rates not only approved through the federal government but also through the state um, insurance department so that means you have dual regulation occurring 
and it be, then is more expensive for the insurance company, which then means it's more expensive for you as the consumer. And we were pretty tickled that we were able to avoid that by actually um, developing a uh, partnership with them. And one of the reasons that we were able to actually do that, I think I already talked about this, next slide, was the fact that the last legislature um, finally um, agreed to pass rate review. Is that in the next slide? Thanks. Um, rate review um, here in Montana. Many people didn't know that the insurance commissioner in Montana has never had the ability to actually review health insurance rate increases. Um, we never saw them. They never filed any data with this office. So when you, as a consumer, got a huge rate increase from your insurance company, whether it was 30% or 20% or whatever, and you were upset about it, and you called my office to say, why the heck are they able to do this? We couldn't answer that question. But now, finally, <laughs> thanks to the last legislative session, um, we have the ability over the course of 60 days to actually review those rate increases. The companies have to file those with my office now. We review them to make sure that they are um, meeting not only federal law but state law and to make sure that they are adequate and they're not um, overcharging you. Um, if we find that we have problems, we can file objections with the company and we can then negotiate within that 60-day time period um, that rate down. And it's already working. I mean, this law has only been in effect now for, what, six or nine months. And so far, we've already gotten at least three different companies to bring down their rates, what, something like 7%, 22%, and 60%. 60. 60%. Yeah. Yeah, this is huge. <laughs> so while we can't, out, we can't flat out deny their rate increases, um, we can certainly do a lot of negotiating within that 60-day time period if we don't think that they're following laws and if we think that they're uh, doing the wrong things. So, so far it's working. Um, so thank you to the legislature for that. So how much is it going to cost you to actually purchase in this new marketplace? Well, that's going to vary depending on what company you purchase from and actually what metal tier you purchase um, your policy in. Um, we have policies that are in the bronze, silver, gold, and platinum levels. And uh, I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but it really has more to do with how much you're going to pay in premium versus how much you're going to pay out of pocket. Um, and obviously when you go on and look at it, you'll be able to look at what benefits are available, look at what networks are available. Obviously that's always important. You want to make sure you're going to be able to have your physician. Your um, physician is going to be covered in that network. You're going to make sure your prescription drugs are covered, what have you. So you want to make sure you look at all those things when you're making your decision. Um, so how much is how much are those going to cost? This chart that you're looking at right now basically gives you um, an idea of what it might cost if you are in the age 25, 40, and 55 um, age groups. We just picked out three age groups. Let's say, for instance, you're age 40 and you've done um, your research and you find that you really like the plans <clears throat> that are being offered in the silver range. Um, you're going to pay somewhere between $242 and $310. And, and that is actually before any tax credits before any tax credits, and that's important to remember. <clears throat> so how do you get a tax credit? Well, what they do is they look at your household income, and if you are between 100% and 400% of poverty level, um, you are eligible for a tax credit, and that's based on a sliding scale, depending on where you're at under that FPL, or federal poverty level. That uh, tax credit is actually paid directly to the company each month, not to you as the consumer. Um, and you can actually, when you sign up, what you'll do is you will actually um, project what your earnings for that, 24, for that year will be. And that's also then how they'll figure out um, how much you're making and what, what you're, what, then what you're uh, eligible for for that, uh, fed, for that federal tax credit. Um, there are some cost sharing reductions that are also 
available on top of the tax credit for people who fall between the 250 and 100% of federal poverty level. Um, so for most of Montanans, um, our average income is a little over $45,000 annually. That means about 80% of Montanans are going to be eligible for some type of tax credit or other assistance. So here's a quick example that shows you that uh, if you are an individual, um, what, where your income would need to fall um, for um, federal poverty level to take advantage of the tax credit, it would need to fall between $46,500 and $11,490. And a, say a family of four, um, that would be $75,000 to $23,550. And this is just another chart that shows you what the federal poverty level looks like depending on your household income. And these are all available on our website if you want to look at them. So um, this is a one point I always like to talk about because for a family who has, let's say one of you who has coverage through an employer and that employer actually offers coverage to members of your family but let's say your spouse is looking at wanting to go out and purchase um, a policy in the new um, marketplace the question comes up well can they do that yep they certainly can but the bigger question is can they take advantage of the tax credit well that depends <laughs> if the coverage that's being offered by the employer is actually considered affordable they cannot take advantage of the tax credit um, and what does it mean to have affordable coverage well <laughs> it means that an eligible employer sponsored plan is affordable if the portion of the premium the employee must pay for self only coverage does not exceed nine and a half percent of the household modified adjusted gross income Okay, for most of you, not all, that means line 37 on your tax return, <laughs> okay? And I am not a tax person, so you definitely would want to talk to your, uh, your tax person, whoever that may be. But this is the, this would be the um, definition. All right, so this talks about how you would go ahead and uh, calculate that income, but I'll just move on. Um, so. What happens with the penalty if you decide not to buy tax or taxes buy buy insurance? Okay, it's phased in over the course of three years. The penalty, um, the first year for an individual adult, it's ninety-five dollars per year, not per month, or one percent of the family income, whichever happens to be greater. And then the second year, that moves up to three hundred and twenty-five dollars, or two percent whichever is greater. And then in the third year, it's $695 per adult or 2.5%, whichever is greater. So what are the exemptions then from that actual individual mandate? Well, let's say that you um, look, and if, if you're looking at buying coverage and the health insurance is actually more than 8% of your income after employer contributions or tax credits, then you're exempt. You do not have to buy coverage. You don't have to worry about paying any kind of a penalty. Um, if your family income is so low that you don't even file a tax return, you are exempt. You do not have to buy coverage. Um, if you have religious reasons why you can't accept any kind of benefit like this, you're exempt. If you're um, part of a recognized healthcare sharing ministry, you're exempt. If you are a Native American, you're exempt. If you are incarcerated, you are exempt. Do not go out and get incarcerated, okay? <laughs> Please. Cost money. <laughs> um, so what are the ways to actually enroll? Um, obviously, there's several. You can go right onto the site yourself if you feel comfortable giving that a try and doing it through the website which is www.healthcare.gov or you could actually go visit with a trained assister um, and we have a list of all those assisters that are on, my, on our website at montanahealthanswers.com um, we actually have every single one of these folks is actually um, registered 
and they have gone through training at the federal level and at the state level and they have had background checks and fingerprints and so we know who they are <laughs> and you will know who they are because they're listed on our website. Um, you can also download an application in instructions at healthcare.gov but based on something I read today you do not want to do that. <laughs> Um, they're very concerned right now they're not going to be able to actually um, process those paper applications so I would not download the paper application or you can call um, a federally trained employee at this 800 number but I wouldn't do that either <laughs> I'm just telling you talk to our folks at the state level don't call the feds all right you want to get this accomplished and I know that there's a couple of folks here today Olivia and I think somebody Yes, and this gentleman back here, and uh, they're going to be able to um, talk to anyone here about uh, um, answering questions because they are our sisters. And is that it? Whoops. Wait, hang on. Dang it. I think I already talked about this. Um, I can talk a little more about it, but I think I'm going to skip over it because we're getting close to time. Um, obviously, small businesses that are interested in purchasing um, coverage through the new, new marketplace or the shop, as they call it, um, they can certainly do that. They are some of them. If they have uh, 25 less than 25 employees, could be eligible for um, a tax credit, which is. Uh, worth up to 50% of an employer's contribution towards their employee plan. Um, they are exempt now, or the, at the, I'm trying to think, oh, I know what it was. Thank you, <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, they actually um, cannot, at this point in time, purchase online through the marketplace because it's just not up and running yet. So they would have to go through their um, producer or agent in order to get that accomplished but if they're interested in that um, they certainly can go ahead and take care of it. Um, as far as fraud let's face it there's folks out there that are incredibly creative and they will do anything they can think of to try and take your hard-earned money from you and uh, there's folks out there creating fake marketplace websites um, there's folks out there calling seniors telling them that because of Obamacare they need to get a new Medicare card and social security you know, a new Medicare number not true absolutely not true seniors do not have to do anything different and any by time somebody is calling one of these folks up on the phone unsolicited that should be a huge red flag to begin with <laughs> And all these fake marketplace websites, um, if it is not healthcare.gov, it, it is not the marketplace, period. End of story. Um, and they also have you know, folks calling up and trying to sell parents um, adult, uh, young adult policies, you know, which is just crazy because the new reform said that you can keep them on your existing policy. You don't need to buy an additional policy. So if you have any questions whatsoever, please, please, please call our office. Um, we can help you out. And um, let me see. There's our 800 number. And then we also, I'm going to, I'll talk about something else real quick. So Medicaid and the Medicaid gap. As I said before, it was envisioned that all the states would pass Medicaid expansion. Now we have an issue with this gap um, where folks who fall in that gap obviously can't afford to purchase on the new marketplace, can't take advantage of the tax credits, and still don't have coverage. And in Montana, we're talking about 50,000 Montanas that are going to continue now because the last legislature did not, and I should say the Republicans, in the last legislature <laughs> refused to pass Medicaid expansion. And they're going to continue to show up in Montana's emergency rooms. They're going to continue to use those emergency rooms as their primary care provider, which means that every single hospital in this state is going to continue to write off tens of millions of dollars in charity care, which you and I are going to pay for. Um, we are, <laughs> this is, it was an incredible, incredible oversight in my opinion. Um, we have, are going to lose out on tens, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in positive economic benefit to this state and, and thousands of good paying jobs 
that would have been created, good paying jobs, will not be created now in this state as a result. And so it's very unfortunate. Um, thankfully, there's, uh, I believe, a group or groups out there that are pushing um, to get the Medicaid expansion <coughs> on the ballot next year. And so folks will have a chance to vote on it. Um, and I think Montanans um, may have a different opinion. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, we're going to lose out on two years of federal funding for all these folks. But uh, in the meantime, they're still going to have to try to figure out where to get care if they're not showing up in the emergency rooms. There, is, there are some, um, ben or, um, some resources for them at the free clinics and so forth, which are listed here. And I already talked about that. And once again, if you are, uh, have Medicare, you're considered covered. You do not need to get coverage any differently than you do now. If you are purchasing Medicare supplement plans, you don't have to purchase those any more differently than you already do. Um, and if you're Medicare eligible, eligible um, <clears throat> you cannot purchase on the marketplace. You know, so if you're 65 and older, they're not going to let you purchase anyway. And as another positive, Obamacare does close um, the Medicare Part D donut hole by 2020. All consumer complaints should still come through my office. And uh, here are some resources that we have. The MontanaHealthAnswers.com website, which has an Ask Away feature where you can write and ask your personal question. And then we will get back to you as quickly as possible with a specific answer, not some canned answer. And uh, <clears throat> there's the federal health care website again, the Small Business Administration. And finally, any questions <laughs> that any of you may have, as well as uh, our Twitter account. So, all right. Whew. That's a lot of information, I know, very quickly. And I appreciate your patience. And I'm certainly willing to answer any questions that any of you might have. Yes? What is prenatal dental? I, we were checking out the marketplace and we noticed that a lot of the plans say, we don't cover prenatal dental, which is required by Obamacare. Yeah, yeah. under the ACA, it says that every one of the plans has to actually have uh, prenatal coverage. And so it, it's kind of ambiguous and confusing in terms of how the law is being, yes? Are you asking about pediatric dental? Well, it's, 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 Den let's just put it this way, if you're interested in having dental for your child, you can purchase that on top of um, the policy, or many of the policies already have that included, but you don't have to. So, so the, I'm assuming all of the plans that are on the marketplace fall under and are meet the requirements of they're supposed to, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and every one of those plans was reviewed by my office, and so they should be ACA compliant. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to ask everyone who asks a question to speak up so we can all hear. And, and I'll repeat it. It's my fault. They don't have a mic, and I'll, I'll repeat it for you. Yes, sir. So on the requirement that they have to spend 80% of your premium dollars on care, does that mean if you don't get sick in a given year and don't spend anything, you get 80% of your premium back? <laughs> they have to spend 80% on care and also other wellness that benefits you. And yes, I mean, obviously, if you're not getting the benefit back, you should be getting cert a certain amount of uh, refund. No. Not individuals, the pool. Okay, my mistake then, I thought it was the individual. I mean, I, I can get back to you with the correct answer. Yes, sir. As you know, the Montana Comprehensive Health Insurance goes away January. MCHA, yes. MCHA goes away January 1. And for those of us that have been fortunate enough to get into the web portal, get told you have coverage, what the premium amount is, and now the problem is, is the carrier doesn't recognize who we are from Adam and Eve. Can we just send, uh, with a letter to, to your office, the undisputed amount of the premium to, and, and let the, your office resolve it? The question is, if you've already gone through the process and thought you had coverage, but now the company that you purchased the coverage through doesn't seem to have your information, can you send the information to me? No. I, I have, 
I don't control the marketplace. The federal government controls the marketplace. What I can do, and I know that you have called somebody in my office, we can work with you to kind of bridge the gap and communicate with folks at the federal level to try and work through what your particular, what appears to be a very technical issue gets solved and resolved. And I, and I understand the frustration, believe me, but legally I have no authority over the, over the federal website or marketplace. All I can do is do my part in terms of reviewing those policies that are being offered in the way that I do that under, under law and also making sure that I'm assisting consumers the best I can. But in terms of what they're doing on the technical end, I have no authority over. And they're not going to recognize a letter from you to me, unfortunately. But we can bridge the gap by communicating with them for you. Yes? Will there be a future opportunity for a state-based marketplace? question is, will there be a future opportunity for a state-based marketplace? marketplace? Um, the issue there has to do with the funding source running out at the federal level, which I believe runs out in 2014, because, and then the, by 2014, 2015, all the exchanges, especially state based exchanges, are supposed to be self sufficient by 2015. So if you were a federal, if you had a federal marketplace to begin with and haven't already begun the process of working with the federal government to get funding to transition to a state based, uh, marketplace which takes about a year. It's highly unlikely that it's going to happen here in Montana unless we came up with the funding ourselves and I don't see that happening. Um, this gentleman and then I'll come over to you. Good yes. Evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, many of us who pay, were paid a lot of attention to health care reform when it was going through Congress uh, and were advocates for it were sort of told it's not perfect right now but Medicaid wasn't perfect, and Medicare wasn't perfect, and we improved those things. So now that we're a couple of years into this reform, from someone who's close to the reform, what, what are the things that we should be looking to improve the next time we get a Congress that will pass any kind of legislation at all? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know when that's going to happen. <laughs> you, you really think so? Well, I hope so. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Gosh, I don't know. The list is long. <laughs> um, I mean, there, for instance, the one, the one issue that I talked about earlier where a spouse um, can't take advantage of the tax credits um, if their, their spouse already has coverage and if the employer is offering affordable coverage. I think that needs to be changed. I think that that's something that a lot of people agree needs to be changed, but you know, unless you can get them to, to agree to reopen it, which at the moment is not going to happen. I mean, that's just one small thing. And there are a lot of other technicalities that need to be changed as well, um, certainly. How about you got any suggestions? I don't, but I hope you're making it. <laughs> oh, believe me, we have a list. <laughs> we do have a list. Yes, sir. Um, thank you, Commissioner. My question of you is that the, the Montana Health Care Freedom Act that ended up in Title 50, does that, does that statute now tie your hands in terms of enforcement? Is that going to be really an issue for you, you know, going forward? And, and if so, what kinds of, you know, are there any, is there anything in there that, uh, uh, is going is to cause problems, what kind of problems, or do you need other legislation to assist your department? Um, I think the question had to do with whether or not the Montana Health Care Freedom Act and Title 50 ties my hands. Now, I'm just think I'm trying to remember, is this, is this the legislation that was passed in 2011 that says that nobody in Montana state government can, yeah. No, it does not tie my hands because it really has to do with, if you, if you go and read it, it really deals with the mandate. And I have nothing to do with enforcing a mandate. That is all done through the IRX, IRX, IRS, um, through the tax system. So do you have any, is there any legislation in the state that you require in order to do a better job with the ACA? Oh, well, there's, yeah, there's some things that I would like. Um, 
I would like to be able to, we, we had a bill in 2011 which also would have taken um, those initial health care reforms that were in place early and would have put those in Montana state law so that if there was a consumer who had an insurance company who wasn't following those laws, called my office up and complained. Um, if it's not in state law, I have no real authority to do anything. Um, so technically, it's the federal government that has to enforce those, those reforms. And so certainly we would like to have those reforms in state law so that we have the ability to enforce. And all the new ones that are going to be in place in 2014 as well. We think that's really important. Because frankly, you know, if you, if you can't enforce these laws, I mean, it's, it, it could be problematic for a consumer in the future. Yes, sir. At the top of your talk, you said 195,000 Montana. Approximately, yeah. I don't know, you might not have access to this information, but do you know how many people have signed up in the marketplace in Montana? <laughs> the question is, how many people have signed up um, to the new marketplace in Montana? And I had this question from um, one of the reporters beforehand. I get this question a lot. Um, <laughs> I get numbers the same time all of you get numbers because I have no authority or control when it comes to the federal marketplace. Um, we can, you know, call up the individual insurance companies and ask them to tell us. Uh, a couple of them are pretty forthcoming. One isn't. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> I'll let you guess. <laughs> um, so, you know, all I know is that based on everything I'm hearing, we know that you know, people are signing up quicker and faster, and but at the same time, based on what I'm hearing nationally, um, they're they're not on a pace to uh, meet their goal nationally in terms of having folks signed up. But you know, there's there's still, a, and I think that the closer we get to the December 23rd deadline, I think you're going to see even more of a rush for people to start trying to sign up which could be problematic as well because then it might start crashing again. Um, so, yeah. One of my biggest concerns truly here in Montana is for folks who are on MCHA, um, the Montana Comprehensive Health Association plan, people who are on the MAC plan, which was the um, federal um, uh, short-term plan for folks who had pre-existing conditions that was put in place as a result of the, the new federal law. Um, these are folks who have serious health conditions and come December 31st they're going to be without coverage if they don't get through this system and so that's my biggest concern right now and we're working How many people is that? Um, gosh I don't know it's probably what there's all there, right now we probably have the MAC plan, we're down to, it's down to about 250. And Montana Comprehensive Health Association, I think it's like three or 4,000, if I recall correctly. So we're, we're working with the MCHA board, and we actually, I know uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield got a federal grant, and they have somebody in their office. We have people in our office who are calling every single one of these people. Um, to talk to them about whether or not they've gotten other coverage and gotten signed up or not because we're very concerned about them. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> thank you. Um, they extended the small business signed up for a year. Do you think if they don't reach enrollment targets, do you think they would extend also, if they needed to. For individuals or for the small businesses? For individuals, the question is whether or not um, I think that the federal government will extend sign up to the individuals in the same way that they've done it for small business. And I would say I don't think so. And, and the reason why I don't think so is because obviously that's their big focus is to move folks as quickly as they can in the individual market into coverage and into the new marketplace and um, because of the way the law is written there are some protections for the insurance company because we know insurance companies because we know that there's going to be some higher costs for them in the first year or two 
uh, because you're going to have some higher risk individuals. There's going to be higher costs in terms of claims. And so there are some, there are some backups for the insurance companies, for those insurance companies that end up with more risk, um, they're going to get some. They're going to get. They're going to get some money for that the first couple of years, and they're doing that through risk corridors, through reinsurance, and some other things that are technical. <laughs> I think we'll have um, one more question, and um, I would actually like to take advantage of that by asking a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Smart woman. <laughs> My question was in regards to one of the um, slides that you had that said that small businesses less than 70 employees would get a significant tax credit as well as the individuals trying to buy um, insurance on the marketplace. Businesses would get kind of the same benefit if they provided insurance for their employees, if I read that correctly. And um, my, no, that is not the case, my understanding um, would be if that's as for-profit businesses, is there any sort of tax credit for non-profit businesses that would provide insurance for their employees as well? Yeah, there is tax credits for non... The question is whether or not there's tax credits available for non-profits as well as for-profits, and yes, they are. But it's for employees, small employers who have... Okay, maybe I'm, I'm thinking about... <laughs> for this In the small group, for those employers that have 25 or less employee or less than 25 employees that they would be able to take advantage of that tax credit and, it, and it's a 50 percent yeah yeah i mean that i mean that's just as big as it says <coughs> individuals getting tax credits to sign up for insurance i think that hasn't gotten maybe as much news that it, it, yeah and it yeah. and it can be it really depends on the business and this is one thing that i've really told small business owners i mean because every business is different in terms of you know what it depends on you know what the margin is for the the <laughs> employer, uh, what they're paying their employees, um, what makes sense in terms of I mean there's just so many different variables for the employer and they really need to sit down with their um, t their tax accountant and really talk through a lot of those issues to figure out if it makes sense or not because there may be other options that make more sense and one of them is honestly whether or not it might even make more sense and might be better not only for them but also for their employees to go out and purchase instead of small group coverage to actually purchase individual coverage um, each one of the employees in the go out and purchase in the individual market instead so it really just depends okay thank you so much for um being thank here. you